This podcast is brought to you by Ideas Digest. I'm Conrad. And I'm Matt. Each week, two optimistic Aussie blokes Very explore optimistic. new <laughs> challenging ideas outside of our echo chamber on our totally realistic quest to achieve world peace, maybe some personal enlightenment. Is that too much of an oversell? No, nah, just roll the montage. Okay. I'm right in your room. What are you talking about? Straight men enjoy gay sex. What? The Bible is extremely pro-abortion. You're a sexist man who loves Jordan Peterson. This is progressive? No, this is arson. Do you think that kick us out? I've done psychedelics 150 times in my life. Why the hell should I trust you now? Don't define me by what I do in bed. Oh my God, these ideas can be like a membership key to a particular social group. So break free from your echo chamber each week on Ideas Digest, anywhere you get your podcasts. It's going to be an amazing time. Amazing. Well, hello everyone, boys and girls, mums and dads, and welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist, second episode, Brian, for season four. It is the second episode, but it is the cherry pop of the interviews, because we're interviewing someone, someone very exciting, aren't we, Troy? I know, we often say, oh, we're excited, we're excited, but I really am excited, and not in a sort of nervous way, but in a, oh, come on, tell us everything kind of way, because this one is Tracy Phelan. Well, not anymore, but once upon a time was a part of Last Days Ministries. And where do we know Last Days Ministries from, Brian? Keith Green. This was Keith Green was so incredibly important to us. But we might just quickly introduce Tracy and get her to say hi. Then I think you and I should chat about who was Keith to us. Like Keith was a father of the faith. He was indeed. So g'day, Tracy, and welcome to Australia. Well, thank you very much. This is very exciting for me to be a part of this as well. So, Tracy, for, for Troy and I, Keith Green was the ultimate spiritual father. Like, he was someone, I mean, we, we knew him obviously through his music, which is his most powerful medium, but also his wife, Melody, who I'm sure you're going to speak about today, wrote his his biography. And that biography, I I am... Without a word of a lie, I read at least 10 to 15 times. Wow. And, and at the end of it, I, I would cry quite often. Those points throughout it when Keith died and then, you know, when Keith would convert a bazillion people and when Keith would do whatever. And it was just like this was a blueprint for my faith in many ways because I wanted to be passionate like Keith. How about you, Troy? I know you, you were similar. Oh yeah, Keith Green was just the shit. You know, he really was. <laughs> I can I can remember there was that verse in the Bible that says, "Some say I follow Paul, and others say I follow Peter, and some say I follow Christ." And I remember reading that and thinking, "I follow Keith," because that's how important he was to me. He was just the the bee's knees, and because his music was amazing, but he was so sold out. I mean, for fuck's sake, the guy had an album called No Compromise, and that was that was how we lived. So I, I, I can't begin to understate how important Keith Green was to us, Tracy. And sorry, you're probably thinking, oh, my God, what am I doing on this podcast? These guys are just, they're right into this, this cult leader. But we were so into him. So we, we were just... We're just thrilled to have you here and we would love to hear your story and we would love to hear you tell us all about how you came into Last Days Ministries and and what it meant to you and what happened in there and then more importantly, how you left. Yeah, um, that's usually when people find out that I was once a part of a cult. Uh, their two questions are, how did you get in and how did you get out? I, I absolutely understand what you're saying because I too, that's what led me to Last Days Ministries way back in 1982. Um, before that, I was 15 years old when I first heard Keith's song, um, literally in a car, uh, Asleep in the Light came on. And we, all of us in the car was from my youth group. Who is this guy? Like, this is such a powerful message. Um, I, I wrote his name down and, and then quickly found the newsletter and, and got uh, introduced to, to Last Days through that, just like you guys. 
And then in, you know, in my, my best friend at the time, we were part of a, a, a pretty on fire youth group. Uh, this would probably be 1979 uh, time frame. We would get our newsletter together. She would come over to my house. We'd sit on the bed. We'd go through all the articles. And, you know, we said, God, we'd love to work there. Wouldn't that just be great? Uh, and I, I don't know how far you guys go back to the newsletter, but usually it said, do not come here. I think I even found a teaching of Keith. He's like, do not just show up on our doorstep, write to us. Um, we're not a training ground. Uh, we, you know, we're always looking for volunteers, but we're not here to kind of help teach you how to follow Jesus. So we always would kind of like go, darn, that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for a place, um, where we could sit at the feet of Keith and really learn, you know, his secrets of how he can, um, I don't know, just do exactly what you guys say, just preach and bring the masses to, to, to Jesus. So lo and behold, in 1982, in January, they actually rolled out their first intensive Christian training program, ICT for short. Uh, and they were now opening their doors to having a training school. Uh, it was uh, going to follow kind of the school of the prophets, if you guys know anything about some, some Bible references. Uh, so this was a school for your heart and not just your head. And it was the first time that Last Days actually curated the people that would be coming to their ministry. I wrote off for the application. It was a very intense application. I was one of the 20 students that were selected for the first ICT training school in 1982. So Tracy, how old were you when you did this, if this is 1982? So I was 18 years old. <laughs> okay, so let's be clear, you are 100% a teenage fundamentalist. I was a teenage fundamentalist. And so a quick backstory, I started Feet of Clay podcast, kind of, you know, a little misleading because there's not quite a podcast yet, but I've been putting that storyboard together. Uh, so I, I got saved kind of on the tail end of the Jesus People movement in when I was 15 years old. I was also blazingly passionate, really wanted to finish high school. I think I share in, uh, some of the storyboards of my podcast that the late great planet Earth was hitting, you know, the world at that time. All of, you know, those great movies of uh, The Thief in the Night and all about the Antichrist and 666 and I was convinced that Jesus, you know, was coming back and coming back soon. And I needed to be out and about the ministry. So long story short, I graduated a year early at 17 years old so that I could go do some mission work in South Africa. So I had already done that and come back <laughs> um, and was facing what am I going to do with my life? Like I, I loved being a, a part of, you know, the mission work that I was doing was, was teaching uh, typing and, and business skills to at that time an apartheid ridden South Africa and came back. But I realized that I needed more training. I wasn't convinced that Bible school was my answer. So in this ICT training school was exactly what I <laughs> would have designed and ordered. So in my you know application, I mean, I wrote 12 pages, you know, typed out of, you know, where I'd been uh, as, a, as a teenage fundamentalist and why I needed to come to Last Days Ministries. Well, I want to ask you, and, and forgive me if I'm jumping ahead, but when you got there and you met Keith, was it like meeting the Pope? Was it one of those moments where you're like, oh my God, it's Keith Green? Or were you just like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a teenage fundamentalist, whatever? No, we were definitely, you know, and one of the things, you know, looking back, obviously I can see a lot into my psychological development at the time, but this was also, you know, the days of Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar. I, I mean, for, for me, particularly Brother, Son, Sister Moon, I mean, this was the whole end of the 70s, just the Jesus people. And I was, you know, a teenage hippie wannabe and he was like central casting <laughs> i mean he had the hair and the passion and the music and so we were very excited to meet keith but one of keith's you know if you guys have followed him is he hated that music idolatry right that was something that he often said you know why are they praising the pencil like i'm just a, a tool in the hand of god so we were very careful to try to mask that. <laughs> like we want to meet this guy, but we don't want him to think that, you know, we're uh, like groupies, right? Because that, that would not be cool. So when we first drove up to the, the ICT training school, there was a uh, gentleman out in the driveway 
who had the same curly hair and my friend and I were like, oh my God, that's Keith. Oh my God, that's Keith. And so we were those teenage kids um, and it ended up not being Keith. You know, later on, you know, part of the ICT training school is you work in the, you have classes in the morning and then you all go in a, in a van to the ministry property, which was about a mile away and work in assigned jobs. And that's where Keith, you know, was walking around as a, as a human being. <laughs> and honestly, he really was everything he portrayed himself to be in public. Like he was, he like literally walked around with a little bop in his step. He was personable, just a normal guy that was passionate about Jesus and had then built this incredible ministry. This ministry was pretty impressive when I arrived in 1982. From the footage I've seen of Keith, like, and there's only, you know, snippets and quite often it's when he's playing and there's the, you know, speaking in between songs. He seemed really intense. Like he, he seemed like that no compromise persona was very much about intensity. No, no room for fluff. It was all about business for Jesus. Was he that intense or you were saying he was, he was quite personable? He was very personable. He had an incredible sense of humour. He was very real. So a couple of my stories like inter intersecting with him. So my my mother was going through some surgery while I was in, you know, the the, the second term of ICT, intensive Christian training school. And, you know, we had a, a prayer meeting that, you know, he, he helped lead at that time. And, you know, I shared and, you know, he'd stop me in the hallway and just ask me how my mother was doing. I had, I had made a, a comment in the prayer meeting that, you know, my parents weren't saved and totally believed that this surgery was going to help lead them to Jesus. And, you know, I said publicly, and my dad hates you. And I pointed to Keith because he had written the Catholic Chronicles. And that was my dad would, you know, go off at home. A goddamn hippie has the audacity to come up against the Holy Roman Catholic Church. So I immediately felt like, oh, I kind of just called him out in the middle of a prayer meeting and said, you know, my dad hated him. And I had caught him in the hallway and like, hey, I'm sorry. I know you're a human being too. And sorry that I, you know, had said that he's like, no, no problem. Um, you know, I totally get it that, you know, those articles did cause a lot of, a lot of issues and, and, and I am praying, I am praying for your mom. So, you know, I think I had just posted something on my Instagram about the movie green pastures, which is got some controversy because of the racial, um, kind of the, you know, what it was saying in the 1936 when it was first published, but he loved that movie. He loved jokes. You know, you can see it, I think, a lot of his personality. And so you want to go back to Egypt, just how he would distill things down and, and, and make things fun. So he, he, he was a lot of fun. And yet he was very direct and very forthright. And, and for those who, who don't know, Keith Graham was an established musician or at least a songwriter before he became a Christian, wasn't he? I think he wrote songs for, was it Cher? CBS, yeah. Yeah, so he, he wrote quite a few quite famous songs. So he was a very established mus musician before he became a Christian. So it's it's also weird that he goes, oh, you know, don't praise the pencil. But he was incredibly, um, incredibly talented. So people are always going to do that. Was there, one thing I've always wondered is what was the connection to some sort of church, was there a connection with Last Days Ministries or was it a typical Waco-esque cult like the Branch Davidians um, that sat out in the, in the middle of, of Waco in Texas, not connected to anything? Or did they have some sort of church, church connection? So it's a very good question. We, we were nestled in an East Texas, what I call a Christian Hollywood, right? So in, you know, within like a five mile radius, you had Youth with a Mission's main headquarters. You had World Challenge of David Wilkerson, his main headquarters. Leonard Ravenhill was established there. Agape Force, which people don't know who Agape Force is. They did a lot of the children's music. Jamie Owens Collins, Dallas Home. We literally live next door to Second Chapter of Acts. So it, it was a mecca of a lot of Christian ministries and world leaders. And so Keith, from the beginning, um, believed that he was to have you know, an eldership. So last days was, was three men. So it was Keith Green, 
Wayne Dillard and Martin Bennett were the elders, and then they submitted themselves to Leonard Ravenhill for mentoring. And then there was a local church that a lot of us could go to on Sunday if we wanted to, but we would, back in the day, would be called a para church. So we were free to to go to any church in the area, but we were not affiliated with a denomination or a church. Did that cause issues from like, in, <laughs> it, because it, it sounds a little mm. bit like a cult um, <laughs> that you, you, you get people in a compound and you're not accountable to anyone else and you might just make up your own rules or be tempted to do so. Was that something you observed? Uh, yeah. So, you know, it started for those of you who don't know, um, it started in California because he was, you know, a musician and got radically saved and started reading the Bible and, you know, hey, Jesus says if you don't have two coats or if you have two coats, you can give, you know, one away. He started taking people in, literally prostitutes, drug addicts. They started renting more houses. Soon they have these people and they, you know, decide to move to Texas (laughs) to live on a ranch um, because they were outgrowing their California roots. Um, I came in, obviously, when they were already established in Texas, and it was what I came in 1982, and it was like a throwback from the mid-70s. It was literally the hippies in this compound, and the townspeople, if you know anything about East Texas, it's like these little tiny, very (laughs) Southern Baptist towns, and you have this group of these hippies kind of coming into town and um, very cult-like. And a lot of rules based because, you know, you have these street people that are coming off. And so a lot of rules were laid down. Then you had, you know, I think particularly the influence of youth with a mission really had a big impact on Keith, some of their, you know, national leaders. And that's where I would say our rules kind of fell in line with some of the other ministries. It wasn't like we were creating kind of one-off rules. We all seemed to be aligned with them, but with anything with Keith, his ministry was to point out error of everybody. <laughs> like, um, you know, so even the areas around us, like Youth of the Mission, frankly, we thought were very worldly compared to us. You know, they went to the, the lake and some people had skin showing that, you know, we would have worn big shirts over. So there was definitely a lot of hubris in us that we were kind of the elite of the elite of the Christians. <laughs> Tell us about your life there. Tell us what it was it like to be a member of Last Days Ministries. Yeah, so like I said, you know, I'll you go through the first term, then you go through the second term, and then you go through an internship, and then you become a staff member. Now, because I was in the first ICT school, we were like the guinea pigs. You had to be selected to stay in the second term. So, you know, the first term was very based on a lot of youth with a mission, and I know if you have other shows about their DTS programs, very similar to that. But, you know, I went through that, did our work at the ministry. We got assigned different jobs. Went The second term, I would say, was probably the most unique because we were chosen to travel with Keith in his concert crusades. This was very exciting for us. So there were 20 people that were accepted into the first term, and then only eight of us were selected to stay for the second term. So that was like a big deal. You know, Keith was really mentoring with Leonard Ravenhill a lot, a lot of Leonard Ravenhill influence. And so Charles Finney was the other big influence. And we were indoctrinated pretty heavily into to Finney's theology. And so Keith and Melody does write about this, you know, in No Compromise, as far as his goal to have these concert crusades at the ministry, what she leaves out and what she often leaves out in a lot of her books is there's an entire ministry that whatever Keith is going through, the whole ministry behind him is seriously in that same mindset. So when she talks about, you know, Keith was a little legalistic, like there was a whole ministry that had a whole infrastructure of intense legalism that we were all living and struggling through. So he's going to these concert crusades. We have 24 seven prayer requirements that we're all signing up to make sure that there's prayer going 24 seven for each of these cities that he will be visiting. We're then chosen to travel with the the concert team. I think she mentions that they fly. There was this big thing called the ARC that was basically a a camper. Um, And so the students, we'd pile into that. And it was our job 
to pray through, you know, every city that we were going to, that when he was up on stage, we were in the back rooms, whatever facility we're in, praying for, you know, this revival, you know, to come out. And then we were there on hand to help counsel, you know, supposedly these hundreds of people that we really expected to fall like in the days of Charles Finney. And, you know, like I said, we had 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 weeks of that studying. And, and if you guys know anything about Charles Finney, he would go into the cities and he would preach and literally hundreds of people would fall to the ground just confessing their sins. And um, there weren't, you know, this altar call. He would tell them to come back the next day. Sometimes these were two and three day events. And Keith wanted this. He believed in this. He prayed for this. We were a ministry behind him trained in this. And so they were disappointment. They were a disappointment to Keith, especially, and to all of us. I'm like, this is, we've done this formula. Like, where is the sin? And so, you know, part of that mentality was God's promised something and you've done everything that you know to do and it doesn't happen. Where's the sin? Who's in sin? Who's the one that, that that's grieving the Holy Spirit? And so there was, you know, a lot of that it mentality at last days through all of this stuff of, and, and then it became, you know, a life of its own where we now need to make sure our brother is not in sin or our sister is not in sin because there's no tolerance. Cause we, you know, we are the elite of the elite sending out these, these words to the church. So if we're harboring sin, it's going to cut that anointing down. So what I'm hearing from you is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that because it wasn't working, the problem wasn't with the formula. The problem wasn't with God. The problem was with us as individuals. Yes. And, you know, the parallel that I'm drawing in my mind, and I've always thought this anyway, is like Keith is like a revolutionary. You know, he, he wants to overturn. He wants to tear down. He wants to, you know, do the latest, newest thing. And when you think about someone like Mao Zedong, for example, in China, whatever Mao Zedong was, go you know, they called it Mao Zedong thought. Whatever was going on in his head, the whole nation had to follow. Like, let's, you know, melt down all the iron, let's kill all the sparrows. The whole nation had to follow. Do you think that it was it was like that? Oh, that's that's really beautifully said, because that's the part, you know, that was so difficult for many of us in reading Melody's book, because she misses that component, right? The whole ministry is going through that. And we didn't come out of it. I can also go into the day that, that the plane crashed and what a devastation that was for all of us. But we never let up for that. So when I was there, I was there a solid five years and then met my husband and married, which is also a second phase of this whole story. But you're, we're working 12 hour days, six days a week, living in dorms with 12 to 14 of us in a dorm, sharing bathrooms, you know, cause this was a ranch house when I arrived. Um, there were some other facilities built as the years would go on, but uh, we lived in the ranch house and then there was a warehouse where the print shop facilities were housed and they had on the upper level uh, a dorm for the, the brothers. So you have that intensity of, and I think at the time when Keith died, what, we were probably 80, 80 people, maybe a little less. It would grow eventually, I think 150 to 200, we would grow eventually. So you have these 80 people living and working six days a week. 12 hour days intensely together, feeling that pressure of it is the work that we're doing that is going to lead these people to Jesus, that this is the work and it's only going to be anointed. It, as Finney said, if we're not harboring sin, if we're keeping clear, if we're being holy, and then we're going through that, but then we're also becoming our brother's keeper and making sure that everybody around us. And so there was often, can I talk to you for a minute? Like that was the dreaded, <laughs> the dreaded statement that somebody would come over to you. And sure enough, they would say, hey, I noticed that when you did this, you know, you were a little snippy or you were a little angry or, you know, I had a brother come up to me. I saw your shoulder, your sweater kind of slipped off your shoulder. And that's really stumbling for me. <laughs> can you not, you know, wear that? So you are just constantly trying to live your most holy life while you're under the spotlight with everybody around you. And that was, you know, that was as it should be. Like we all said, this is what we signed up for. You know, I kept journals. I have stacks of journals. They are so filled with so much angst 
and anxiety and introspection that it's staggering for me now to read. But at the time, that was, you know, that's what I thought I signed up for. Was there a reporting system if somebody was not responding well to your encouragement or to your admonition? Did you dob on each other? Absolutely. So we had the group leader structure. Uh, so for every everybody was assigned to a group and then there was group leaders and then those group leaders kind of reported up to the elders, right? So there was always three elders, then you had your group leaders and then you had your people. So if, you know, if you went to a brother, you know, and they didn't correct them, then you would go to their group leader and then they would sit you down. And if things didn't change from there, you could be asked to leave. So you've said that you were working 70 odd hours a week. Obviously you got accommodation for that, maybe food. However, did you get an allowance? Was there any anything else? How did you live? Did you live off off Keats bread alone? You come, you pay to be a student, right? And I think that's where you follow the youth of the mission kind of formula. And I've seen that now repeated, like Team Mania, all these other kind of ministries that you know are falling. You pay, right? So I paid to go to my first term, and part of that acceptance was I would have to have enough money to self support myself through that. 10 week program. Then the second term when you were selected, you you were allowed to you didn't have any spending money. You still had to support your own spending money, but you know your food and board was taken care of. Then you went through an internship and you still had no spending money you needed to either raise that on your own or have savings that you were able to draw from. Then when you were got to be on staff, and that was like a big deal. You got accepted and went through this acceptance thing to be on staff. You would begin to get a stipend. I had my savings because I had worked when I got back. And so I went through first term and second term. And then I was I was immediately put in charge of the track department. So the other aspect of this, and uh, I had just called this out on my Instagram as, as well, is there was definitely a firm belief that where God anoints, he will equip you with whatever it is that you need. So sounds all great. A lot of pressure, right? So you are put in a role and then you are expected to be successful in that role according to your relationship with God. So we're, you know, we're at the dawning of computer age. You know, we have this mailing list that, you know, Keith is going out to these concerts and bringing back thousands of names that are coming back. So we have a computer input department who all day for those, you know, 10 hours are literally maintaining the mailing list. We have a guy uh, that didn't have any formal training, but very computer minded, who was programming all of our, you know, computer stuff to do that. We had the the print shop team who literally bought a used press and put that together. We had my job as the track department was all those orders that you would order from last day's ministries. We would hand pick those, hand wrap those ship those out. And then the newsletter was like the the big deal of, you know, every six weeks that we did it. We ran what we call Kirk Rudy teams. It was a big mailing machine that took all the computer print out of those uh, addresses and it would slice them up and glue them to, to the magazine. And we would run that, what we would call a burn schedule. We would run that 24 hours until every last newsletter was put in a mailbag and dropped off at the post office. There was only a few people that could run that big mailing machine. I was one of them. Uh, My current best friend is another one who was actually a wife of the elder. And so we would have to be up two and three days (laughs) Um, until we got that down because the timing, you would not want anybody to miss God's word because you were delinquent right and getting that out and so with that also came pressure (laughs) so let's let's revisit this because we seem to be hitting a lot of the points that we see on models of cults so you were not being paid or at best underpaid you were not getting enough sleep you were subjected to a whole heap of rules you were self-condemning you were reporting on one another This really sounds very, very culty. And can I also say, though, and Brian, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking that Tracy's really telling us a story that this could be a Hillsong person telling us their story because you join first for the for the ministry school then you do an internship then you bust your chops waiting to be taken on staff 
And I'm just thinking if I was in Hillsong and I was listening to this, I'd be thinking, oh. And a lot of people in Hillsong think, oh, this is all new. This is all amazing. It's really only the scale because the the model seems to be exactly the same. Yes, which is Youth with Emissions' current model. A hundred percent. And I was thinking exactly the same thing, Troy, because as you know, I have a family member who is about to enter the, the Hillsong school and is going up there this year. So it's the same, exactly the same model. It is frightening. You talked about a lot of those legalistic type things. What were some of more of your your day-to-day expectations and how did that also play out for Keith and Melody and the family? Were they subject to the same rules, the same expectations? Did they have the same, I guess, the same... Standard of living. Yeah, yeah I was going to say the same comforts as, as you didn't have. Um, you know, how, did, how did that work and, and how did that feel? Yeah, so I so I would say in you know what I have to say about Keith Green and what I have to say about Melody Green are two very different stories, right? Yes, Keith was always a part of it. He was rolling up his sleeves with the press. He was very into the gadgets and you know walked around and definitely participated in all of that. Obviously, he he died in July of 1982. At that time, Keith and Melody were living in a house across the street from the main facility. You know, she was pregnant, you know, with her, what was it, fourth child. And so all my time there, she was at the house. We hardly ever saw Melody. And she was a mother. She was doing her mother thing. That that was that. Which is why the book is so hard, No Compromise, because she is completely isolated <laughs> from this machine that has been built up behind, even to support Keith's, you know, whatever you can afford policy. Like, n- people can't just do that without a huge infrastructure behind them, right? The people that are putting in the mailing list, the people that are doing all that work free of charge that we're not getting paid for. And so, no, she did not have a group leader. She did not live in a three high bunk with two shelves. She did not work 12 hour days. She did not um, work six days a week. She was very isolated from, from that lifestyle. Hi, I'm Stephen. And I'm Celine from the Cult Hackers podcast. So I'm a former member of a high control group, otherwise known as a cult, who left when I was about 30. That's about the time my daughter was born. That's you, Celine. We explore what it's like to be in a cult and leave one. We interview former members and leading cult experts. And we also talk about the long journey of making sense of the world afterwards. Yeah, that's a journey that you've witnessed and helped me with. I'm a media graduate interested in the place cults have in our society. And I'm an organisational psychologist these days with an interest in leadership and who also studies cults and cultic groups. There's a new episode every week where we look at cults from every angle and attempt to crack the cult code. So search for Cult Hackers on your favourite podcast app and catch up with us every Saturday. Are you doubting your religious beliefs? Having questions about changing or leaving your faith? Well, you're not alone and Recovering from Religion is here to help. Learning how to live after questions, doubts, and changing your religious beliefs is a journey. The people at Recovering From Religion are intimately familiar with this path and are there to help you cross that bridge. Their passion is connecting others with support, resources, community, and most of all, hope. They offer both peer and professional support. Find out more by visiting recoveringfromreligion.org or find the links in our show notes. So I've been to this time and, you know, we're single, like I would say out of the whatever 80 people, there were only a couple of homegrown marriages with no kids. Uh, We did invite another couple who would be the pilot and his wife. You guys, if you look up the crash, you'll know Don Burmeister. Uh, His wife ended up being a very, very close friend of mine. But very few couples, very few families, a lot of single people. So we're like, you know, we're single. We don't have anything else to do. This is fine by us. I'm working in the track department. We're working through all this time. Um, We had an airstrip. So like if you guys see the aerial shot, there's, you know, the warehouse and out the side door is an airstrip and a hangar. And we had two pilots on staff. 
One was a bush pilot who grew up as a missionary and was used to flying, I think, all, all over little places. And the other one, Don Burmeister, was an Air Force pilot who had literally, the, he and his wife sold everything that they had, bought a little trailer to move it onto the property and, and donated their time to Last Days Ministries. We were used to the plane going up and down for all kinds of reasons. So that night of, of July 28th, I'm in the track department. What we would often do in, in East Texas is the sunsets were amazing, as, as were the, the lightning storms. So we would often call sunset break. And so as in our evening shift, we would walk out of that side door and look at, look at the sun and then come back in. So the plane had just gone up. Uh, no one thought anything of it. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody comes comes bursting in and they said, there's smoke coming from from the, the tree line, which is literally just right beyond the airstrip. So we all pile out and we can see a very, you know, ominous, dark circling of of the, the smoke. And immediately, I mean, you know, I have we thought it was the other pilot. So there were two wives whose husbands were pilots and no one knew who was up in the plane from the group of us that were out there and which pilot was, was in the plane. No idea that Keith or any of his kids would have been in the plane at, at that moment. So everyone's like, go find Grace. She's the wife of the other um, pilot. So she comes down. No, no, no. It's, it's not my husband. He, you know, he was out in town doing this other thing. So we all knew at that point that it was, Don Burmeister. When they came to live at Last Days, they had two sons that they brought with them. So devastating, devastating. And meanwhile, and you can read, you know, in No Compromise, Melody spells all that out as far as what, you know, she is going through that night as, as we go see. So we're, we're stunned, beyond stunned. Uh, and immediately, I mean, it's interesting because before social media, the radio network was fast and immediately this news hit the radio waves and it started going out into national radio all over. And I was actually assigned to, to handle the phone calls that were coming into our switchboard those, those next three days. And, you know, you had everything from, you know, God has told me that we're supposed to raise keys from the dead, you know, and I was given instructions like give, you know, give no information um, except for what we know, talk people through it. Don't go into, you know, anything as far as like this being raised from the dead. And, you know, if you guys have read the story, I mean, they were pretty much incinerated upon impact when the plane went down. Devastating. I mean, we were all, you know, when I first had gotten to the last days, I had, you know, had the task of driving Keith's son, Josiah, to his preschool. And, you know, we were small enough that we were all very intimately acquainted. And so this was just a devastating loss. And of course, you know, Melody has endured the most devastating loss. It's not just, you know, her husband, but it's two of her children. Whereas, you know, the pilot's wife, um, you know, she would always say, well, I didn't lose my kids on that flight, right? You know, when they would, you know, see how she kind of handled the grief versus Melody. And then, of course, you know, the family that was visiting that we didn't have a lot of personal connections to, but very, very, very devastating. So within weeks of this, Youth with a Mission, and of course, we're nestled right among all these uh, leaders and ministries, and they're rushing all to us, right, to help us through. And within weeks, Youth with a Mission is part of installing Melody Green as the leader of last days, to the horror of many of us why, you know, many of us in our own, you know, conversations, why would God saddle this woman who has just endured a loss that none of us can comprehend with this responsibility of leading a ministry? You know, I, I, I get it. She's got, you know, the notoriety. She's got the name. Definitely wanted to do the memorial concerts. After that, she would be the one drawing the crowd. But I, I, you know, I think that was the, the worst thing for her as a human being. I think it was really bad for us as a ministry. So the years in that post time of her being at the helm grew increasingly worse. And many of us, you know, because I thought, why haven't many people come out and, and really challenged even the story of no compromise? 
And I think it's a lot of it is we loved Melody. <laughs> we understand that that loss is something that a lot of us can't comprehend. And so there's just grace upon grace for that. But she was in no position to be leading a ministry. She shouldn't have been leading a ministry. No one should have put her in control of that. And the amount of her lifestyle versus what was kind of happening at the ministry began to be a chasm that grew. What you're describing here is that you have this this organization, Last Days Ministries, and, and at the head of it is this charismatic, extremely talented, sold out himself person that is that is Keith Green, and then the head is cut off. And you're saying that at that point, the Youth with a Mission leadership comes in, takes over, establishes uh, Melody as the leader, but you'd already described to us that Melody had been cut off from the rest of you. She wasn't, she wasn't Keith. She wasn't a part of all this. Correct. So, so the impact, I guess, on, on you folks as, as followers was disillusionment, disappointment, what? So, and if you remember, Keith was always very proud that he had a three person eldership, right? So it was Martin, Wayne and Keith. And Martin and his wife, Sharon, were probably Keith's closest friends at the ministry and whom really ran things like in secular terms, they would have been the chief operating officers. They were like the brains behind, you know, getting the newsletter out, getting everybody in in their positions. So we weren't quite as disillusioned from our day to day because, you know, we would be still dealing with Wayne and still dealing with Martin. And the kind of the, we viewed her as a figurehead, frankly. It was like, okay, YWAM's going to put her in as a figurehead so that they can keep the ministry going. There was controversy because women in ministry, right? Women in leadership. So Leonard Ravenhill is from the old school where women aren't established in major leaders. And so that was kind of one of the first hurdles of like, I don't, think Leonard Ravenhill is going to bless this, right? So Youth with a Mission pushed really hard. Martin and Wayne agree. They're like, hey, it's not us. We agree to be in this triune leadership structure with Melody Green. And that would give birth to a lot of problems that would continue to happen until 1985, when it reached a point where many of us were going to Martin and going to Wayne saying, we have a problem with what Melody <laughs> is saying. We have a problem with where Melody is leading this. We don't think that she should be at the helm anymore. This is now becoming a political organization. Lots of different reasons, right? And so they began to go to Youth with a Mission and say, we have a problem here. We're no longer in alignment. And Youth with a Mission said, hold it. We're going to send you couple, we're going to send Melody and we're going to send Martin and Sharon and Wayne and Kath to our leadership training school in Hawaii. And you guys are going to work out all your problems and you're going to come back and then we're going to hear from God on how he wants last days to go forward. Um, Because up until that point, you know, Melody started wanting to do the artist retreat at, at our place and all these artists kind of coming in. You could tell she wanted to be a singer, right? Like, great, go be a singer. (laughs) Um, she actually did get engaged to another member of staff at that time that ended up being just weird and awkward and kind of falling apart. And uh, I mean, she's a mother and raising these kids. And I mean, I have literally in my journals, like, I think she's supposed to step down <laughs> and go be the person that she's supposed to be as she's, you know, dealing with all this stuff that she's been dealing with. So they go off to the Youth with a Mission training school. And Martin and Sharon, you know, this is where you get into the, you know, I heard from God, you heard from God, what's what's God saying? Martin and Sharon have a very strong sense, it's over. It's kind of like, Keith died, he had the mission, we've done our purpose, we've done the concert crusades, our message is kind of not that relevant anymore. It's time to shut the door, it's time to sell the assets, and let's distribute them among the staff and let everybody now go off and do what it is that, that they may have always wanted to do. 
simultaneously, several of us who hadn't talked were having that same sense. It's over. It's time to shut the doors. And one of the things that was always Keith, but he would always say, like, when I'm, you know, we would study Catherine Booth and William Booth with Salvation Army. And he would always say, I don't want to be like the Salvation Army. When it's time to close our doors, we need to close our doors. We don't want to just be this, you know, ministry that just kind of keeps kicking on. You know, and Martin was a close friend of that. So, he feels that supposedly, and I wasn't in on those conversations, Wayne and Kathleen also felt that, and it was time to shut the doors and youth with a mission. And I don't know how much you guys know about that, but Lauren Cunningham, who sits at the top of youth with a mission, and then they have a whole world organization of leaders that, that have had a lot of influence on last days. And they actually came in and led our ministry while, while they were out in, in Hawaii. And in my opinion, watching all this happen is they couldn't bear to see this asset close its doors because we were also a feeding ground to their ministry. Um, a lot of people went to Keith's concerts and, you know, wanted to be involved in missions and they would go be a part of youth of the mission as a result of it. So they came back there, you know, there was also stuff I didn't want to get into that caused a lot of grief and hurt with Melody Green's leadership, right? She was very disconnected. She she lived off the property. She did have nannies. There wasn't the kindness that people were were getting from her. There was a lot of people that said, we do not think that she's the one that should be at the helm. And so when they came back in and YWAM said, no, this is God. Melody is going to continue to be the leader. And we are going to basically kick Martin and Sharon out. They have two weeks to pack up their stuff, get everything out. <laughs> and we caution any of you guys to not talk to them because if you talk to them, you're going to make it more difficult because you're going to hear a part of the story that basically is the devil's <laughs> version of the story. <laughs> So we interviewed Dave Andrews a little while ago, who was there at the very beginnings of YWAM, and he tells exactly the same story. He was let go. People in YWAM International were told, do not speak to him, do not have anything to do with him. So this is definitely the MO of YWAM as we have experienced it. And we had not. So we're stunned, right? Because we have this openness and honesty in our DNA. We have this, what, what's happening? Why is Youth with a Mission saying this? Martin and Sharon were Keith's right-hand people. <laughs> Martin ran the print shop. Sharon ran all the album distribution. Like They were very connected to the rest of the ministry. So now all of a sudden, we're not allowed to talk to them <laughs> um, for fear of being caught up with the devil. And then, you know, at this point I had just gotten married and I'm also like, whoa, uh, this is crazy what's happening. And, you know, so I have my own individual um, experiences with the leader that was put over us who, who basically said that to me, if, if you disagree with what we are saying is the direction of the Lord you are, we can't say you're hearing from the devil, but there's only one truth. It's God's truth or not God's truth. So if you're not hearing what we're saying is the truth, guess who you're hearing from? <laughs> well, they, they literally, they literally demonized you. So let me get a sense of yes. time here. So what year are we in now? Are we still in 82 or have you moved into 83? Yeah. So 1982 is when Keith's plane went down in July. 1983 is when they pursued all of the memorial concerts and it was a world tour and Youth with a Mission was very involved in that. Big feeding into their ministry. I think they had huge enrollments right after that. 1984 and 1985, we had grown. I think when Keith died, our mailing list was like 250,000. In 1984, because I was just leaving the track, we have 450,000 mailing lists. And to put that into context, I ended up attending, you know, a, a magazine fulfillment seminar just so I could learn more about some of the computer technology that was coming on board. And I sat next to Highlight Magazine and Reader's Digest, and they were stunned at that level of, of distribution. That's a huge, huge number. So, and it was still going strong. And then in 1985, that that's 
really where uh, Americans Against Abortion started taking center stage. Um, Ronald Reagan, there was petitions going on. There was a whole political arm of last days that, that Melody really brought forth, and that was her passion. And there, there were several of us. I was not into that. <laughs> um, I, I did not sign up or come or work that many years to be a part of a political organization, right? That was super important to me. Um, I think the book talks about Melody going around the country with a a baby, an aborted fetus that had somehow been preserved that she called Baby Choice. That is correct. She would go around and display this baby to, to try to show people that, th- that these abortions were late term, something like that, right? Yep, you got you got it right. Baby Choice, they had little tiny caskets built for that. We um, tag team with a, another gentleman who was walking across America, and he was taking Baby Choice with him across America, trying to show that, amassing a huge petition to give to Ronald Reagan to help, you know, in that right to life. And it was a huge focus. And, you know, and there were, you know, a couple of people who w- were into that. But I would say that in the strain in the vein of Keith Green, we would have approached things more of, hey, we're about people's hearts being changed and then let God deal with them on that. And it's not necessarily what we're signing up is to have protests at your local pro-life things. And so, you know, there's a picture, I think, of Melody being carried off um, by the police because she was protesting in front of one of those. And so a split began to happen in where we thought we should be going and where we were going. And layered on top of that was this singing. I think she wanted a, a singing ministry. And so we had another gentleman, Bob Ayala. For those of you who follow Christian music, he joined our ministry, be- beautiful musician. And so she and, and he would, would start singing and great backup singer. She just, she did not have the voice or the power or the passion to carry stadiums, right, to be able to do that. And so, uh, you know, I think the leadership was like, no, we don't concur that this is the direction that we're to be going. And so there were just more confrontations between leadership on the direction of last days, but she was the head, which led them then to Youth with a Mission for Council, which led Youth with a Mission to send them to the LTS school, which then when they completed that, that's when they, um, everyone came back and Martin and Sharon were like, we do not concur that she is to be continually established as the leader. We believe strongly we are to close our doors. How did you end up leaving then? What was, what was your journey out and, and what did you go through? So at, at this time, I mean, like I said, I was involved head of the track department and then I ended up moving to be head of the school. So now instead of being a student at the school, I'm training all these people um, that are coming through our ICT school, you know, and I'm getting married, right? So at the end of this 1986, which is a whole other story that had purity culture and stuff we didn't have labels for back then, but definitely card carrying members of you have to get leadership approval and everyone has to bless this. And so this big rigmarole of, of us getting married at last days. So we're married and leading the training school as all of this is, is coming down. So 1987, we're freshly married and Martin and Sharon are back from this LTS. We're told by Youth with a Mission leader that we're not even allowed to talk to Martin and Sharon, which we did anyway good for us. And I had already, you know, had a strong sense of this is not the ministry that it used to be. This is not the place I want to be at anymore. But my husband felt differently. (laughs) So we're newly married. And now, you know, I have this whole new, like, I have to submit to this man that it's like, I should have stayed single. (laughs) It's so much easier. And he felt a very big responsibility, you know, to to keep doing the school because we had, you know, actively accepted this next batch of students in. And this is where it gets a little crazy. Can I just stop you for a moment and say, this is where it gets a little crazy? <laughs> okay, prepare to wow me. <laughs> so I, I, Sharon and I don't even know what to do with this story So, because this really does get crazy. So Martin and Sharon 
are literally, I mean, when you look at it, just even from a human compassion, I mean, Sharon had been there since, you know, 1979, you know, with back in the day with Keith, you know, the part in Melody's book where she says, you know, we went to Europe, the people that Keith chose to go to Europe with were Martin and Sharon. Like they've been the mainstays of this ministry, helped build the press up from the ground. I mean, they've, they built last days. So now you have this couple that literally has two weeks to get out with nothing. Like they have nothing. They have nowhere to go. They have no financial help. And so they're devastated. So we don't even realize that we've A, been a part of a cult, (laughs) that the cult is coming apart. And so there's so much spiritual trauma that we don't even have the words or the vocabulary to understand. And they're devastated. So they moved to California because they literally had two weeks to get their stuff and get out of there. And, you know, a few of us had talked to them and they're, you know, kind of giving their side and people start leaving. Uh, at least half of the people started leaving last day's ministries at, at that point. And we called it the great exodus, right? So couples are leaving. My husband and I, are still there watching all of our dear friends and people that we've worked side by side leaving. Sharon is devastated that like, am I the devil? Am I not the devil? You you know, is this what's happening? And so she does a prayer. (laughs) There's some, there's some tornado activity. And she says like, God, if I'm crazy, if I'm the one in sin, um, let me know. And if I'm not, if we heard correctly, please send a sign, right? So the next morning, a freaking tornado devastates our property. <laughs> it hits Melody Green's house. It jumps across the street and devastates the ranch house. It goes back towards the print shop and takes out the sidewall of the print shop. It heads back towards the Um, the trailers where I'm living and then veers miraculously and leaves the property, but it hit every key point of the property. What what do you do with that? So of course that has its own life and it starts people, you know, start talking about it and youth with a mission uses that. So Lauren Cunningham, we all have to go to the cafeteria as a shelter because it's built up against a hill for the tornado And then Lauren Cunningham, who's like a big wig and youth with a mission, they pipe him in to get in front of the story to tell us that that is not any kind of sign from God, that that is the beginning of blessings for us. So we're in the cafeteria. I think it's six o'clock in the morning. We'd been all night because of, you know, this tornado activity that's going on. And Lauren Cunningham is telling us how this is the beginning of blessing. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Um, The next day, people had already cleaned up. And then all of a sudden, Melody and the rest of us says, stop, don't clean up, put all the trash back because we're going to videotape this so we can send it to 700 Club and raise money for us. And that's when I'm like, I got to get out of (laughs) here. I I can't, I can't do this. I don't know what's happened to us. So that's a crazy story. Um, My friend Sharon and I, you know, we talk about writing a book. We don't know what to do with that, right? Because both of us have walked away. Like, what is that? (laughs) But Youth with a Mission definitely said, see, that's proof that they're in league with the devil. (laughs) And here we are, we're we're almost 40 years on. And, you know, I, I just Googled while we were talking and, Last Days Ministries is certainly alive and well, and you can sign up to to Melody's newsletter still, um, and it's still a very politicised website. Definitely the face there is Keith. Keith on the piano is the first thing you see when you open up that webpage, and 40 years on, they're still using his face to, to promote, but obviously it's not about him, and it's definitely shifted. I mean, if you look at the, the time frame, he might have started it, but uh, Melody certainly has hijacked it. Yeah, and that's part of, it's kind of like, why now? Why am I I coming out and and saying things? And obviously in 2022, it was the 40th anniversary. And, you know, we all start getting these invitations to, we all want that outpouring like Keith had. We want to resurrect, you know, what happened, you know, to this this passion. And uh, it's time, A, whoa, (laughs) it was not all daisies and butterflies. Behind all of that passion was some really deep spiritual trauma that happened 
in the best of days, just by nature of having a cult commune operate with that level of intensity. Then you have this exodus mixed up with who's the devil, who's God, and people literally who've given the best years of their lives to to building this ministry. I mean, we had the the article, should a Christian go to college? And the implied answer was no, <laughs> because you should be using those best years for the Lord. So you have all of these people leaving who have no major skills, some of them just starting families, literally with no place to go, trying to understand what just happened in their lives. And frankly, I think I have a picture on one of my Insta stories that we had a reunion like a year later, over 50% of those people are divorced. Like the amount of devastation that has taken place in those lives because of all of this is the part of the story that hasn't been told. So you read Melody's book, just like you guys, like, it's amazing, all this stuff. It's like, no, no, no. There's a whole underbelly of a lot of pain, a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of spiritual abuse. And it needs to be told because we don't want to go back to that. Anyone that reads No Compromise, you read between the lines and you can see that there was stuff going on. And I think even Melody is trying to make some of those points. Like I know she dismisses it and she sort of brushes it aside, but she does lead the reader to think it wasn't all great. Do you think she wrestles with that herself or do you think she's completely beyond that? So she wrote the, I think it was 1989, which was two years after what I call the mass exodus, where there was a lot of pain and it ended in in really bad terms. And, And so I look at that book and I say, what did she leave out of the book that's very telling? And that she left every story about Martin and Sharon out is an extraordinarily telling tale to me. There was bitterness. I think there was resentment. Um, I think that still goes on today. I think that if she looks at herself in the mirror, she has to know that she did wrong by the people whose back this ministry was built on, right? She doesn't address that. However, she has had definitely her share of pain. I mean, even after that, and she doesn't really spell it out in the book, but she did get married right at the time where the ministry was closing to, I don't know if, you know, we were gone by this time. So I don't know if YWAM introduced her and then quickly divorced after that. I think it was from all accounts, not, not a great, not a great thing and, you know, has struggled. So I guess my beef now with these 30 year anniversaries and the 40 year anniversaries is you know, the why. Um, We all have have grown and matured and gone on and trying to keep that alive as kind of like the glory days uh, is something I think she should move on from. (laughs) And we all who were there need to be able to come in honesty and say uh, there, there was some definite problems there. I mean, I, my observation would be that she could never walk away from that. Now, that's, I mean, it's been longer since then. So this is imprinted. This is part of her identity. So I, I don't think she's, I think it's too late. The The horse has bolted. When did you finally leave? What, what was the year that you would say is the marker for you that you actually walked away from LDM? My husband and I left in July of 1987. So that would have been, we stayed for six months of the pain and torture of a lot of people leaving and a lot of confusion and youth with the mission stepping in. The joke is, you know, you can take the girl out of the cult, but you can't take the cult out of the girl. We basically moved and started up phase two um, with a lot of people who had also departed. So in uh, Pennsylvania, six other couples and then some local couples joined us for our own version two of um, home church that was the remnants of the last days. And it took me another, what, almost 15 years to actually come out of the spiritual trauma and uh, awakening up to like, whoa, this is this is not healthy as we started having children and living that. So so this is the early 2000s, mm-hmm. around about. So you were you stayed involved between 87, 2002 through home church. You've, you've got stuff happening in your life that you're trying to keep that going. 
What's happened in those 20 years since then? Where where have you fallen now? What do you identify with as um, in terms of your spiritual beliefs or is there no spiritual beliefs that you have? Tell us, tell us about that sort of stuff. I walked away from the faith in 2005 before we had labels, right, to know what deconstructing was. I got married, we call it a cult wedding, right? I'm pretty sure my ex to this day, God talked him into marrying me, right? We were a good fit for the ministry because we were leading the school together. We immediately adopted with the, the following of the couples that we had, bought completely into Larry Tomzak and People of Destiny at the time and their methodology for raising and disciplining children, Mary Pride, no birth control. We were going to trust God with um, having our our family size. So I started having babies immediately, right? So I have five children. Um, four at the time were under the age of five and then a little straggler and homeschooling. So we were home churching and homeschooling and home birthing and really trying to keep these kids, you know, away from the world so that we could make perfect little Christians. And, you know, it was really through that process of my kids coming with powerful questions <laughs> and and definitely some pain that that they were feeling being raised in this environment that that pushed on me and I, I started a two-year uh, study. You know, my, my daughter was into ice skating. The bookstore was right next door. So I would go while she was practicing and just started reading all the Christian histories, all the stuff that I never got to learn when I was 15 and kind of bought into all this and really started to see, wow, there, there's, there's a whole truth out there that I didn't realize. And so another crazy story is the part of the, the group that was post last days, one of the gentlemen had, had died uh, in his 40s of lung cancer, never smoked, very, don't know what caused it, very part of our tight knit community, devastating to us. And my ex and another woman who was formerly from last days wanted to perform a ritual of raising him from the dead. And I was already starting to see some of the really unhealthy parts of what was happening. And I could see just from the outside that this family is grieving, their boys are grieving. And to add this element in the midst of all of this was super unhealthy to me. It was like, wow, this, we've, we've gone off the rails, like that, um, that this is kind of the answer to that. That I would say was an event that started me starting to vocalize some of my questions. And then eventually I did come out of the closet. I came out and said, I do not adhere that the Bible is inerrant. I wrote a manifesto because I'm intense. <laughs> um, so I wrote it all out of why and sent it to, you know, my uh, fellow church people. And I, it was the reaction was just as you hear from lots of other circles, an intense, we didn't have the word shunning, but I was basically told, you know, I can't be around certain people's children anymore, that there's nothing that stops me from taking an AK-47 into the streets because I have no moral grounding. I mean, it was, it was intense and it was fierce. And then ultimately my, my, my husband at the time, my ex said that he, you know, he was willing to still stay with me and be unhappy. He literally said, uh, you know, happiness is not my choice. I'm willing to be unhappy for the rest of my life as long as, you know, I'm doing what God wants me to do. And I said, you know, that's not going to work for me. So I, I ended up getting a divorce and, and walking away from the faith and, and taking your life back, taking my life back and my kids. Right. So, you know, that, that's kind of the stunning part of all this story is, my kids never, like we did everything we could to raise these, you know, protected kids from the world and not one of them today <laughs> has anything to do with this. Like they have their own stories of trauma, but they just, I was like, why? You know, because other groups, you know, that have children, some of them are, you know, definitely Bible believing fundamentalists today. And none of my kids are. And they're like, we just saw from the beginning that we did not want to be like any of you guys. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Tracy, I guess one thing I'd really like to do in, in hearing your story and hearing the way that it sort of 
soured and soured and soured. Let's come back to the very beginning and think about your time with Keith. Do you look at that now and see it as glory days and wasn't it wonderful? Or do you really see this was the beginning of my cult experience? That's a good question. Definitely the beginning of my cult experience. I will say that it took me and my best friend, Sharon, who was the wife of one of the elders, years before I could even use the C word cult. Like we were not a cult. I I could never say that. And even at the time though, from my youth group, when I'd go home, because we'd get you know, Christmas vacation, I'd go back to my hometown in El Paso. And my youth pastor would try to pull me aside and tell me I was changing, right? So we were becoming radical like Keith was. Nobody was pure enough. Nobody was holy enough. Everybody had error. And when you live in that framework where only you in a very, very select group of people have the truth and everybody else is in error, that is dangerous, bad psychological shit. (laughs) Um, And that happened while Keith was alive. And that happened in that Petri dish of last day's ministries. And it's prevalent in all of my journals. So I thought they were my glory days, but I, I remember I was becoming more and more detached from life, you know, like going to the mall would just be like, you know, sin, sin, like all these people are just, you know, all going to hell. It was, it was definitely a terrible mindset to live in as a young person. I think Tracy, the the phrase you're looking for is they were asleep in the light. (laughs) I think you, I think you are correct. Oh, Brian, how can you be so numb not to care if they come? If they come. (laughs) And we care, right? I cared. (laughs) Like I internalized that message to such a degree that, I mean, I went home, as a matter of fact, one of the, what was it, the... Uh, phone home. What's the movie? Steven Spielberg. E.T. So I went home for a holiday and my dad took me to this movie and I just was devastated. I'm like, they're trying to imitate the story of Jesus. They're having him, you know, re-raised from the dead on the third day. They're leading entire kids away. And my dad is like, you're crazy. So I could see it in everything, right? That it was the devil's work to try to deceive the masses and I couldn't enjoy anything. I just think it's amazing that we from the outside, you know, we're listening to Keith Green's music and and this is for us is happening in the in the late 80s, 90s, right? So we are we are definitely not contemporaries in, at least in our faith of of Keith himself, but we were just thinking wouldn't it be great? to be a part of that and to be here we are now hearing the story and we're thinking, wow, glad I dodged that bullet. (laughs) You know, it's just sounds, it just sounds really, really terrible. Now, Tracy, you're going to start a podcast. You've already got an Instagram page. I mean, I, I want to encourage you to tell your story if for no one else yourself. Right. And you know, the idea of a book, I I think, yeah, books are great, but there's the, there's a thing about podcasting that you can just do this long form storytelling, even be therapeutic. But more than that, I think this is a story that needs to be told because we are testament to the fact that Last Days Ministries, Keith Green, Melody Green, the No Compromise book has shaped us, has impacted us. So to be able to tell the flip side, to be able to tell the underbelly, I think is crucial. So I really want to admonish your sister in the Lord. No, I really want to encourage you to <laughs> to write, uh, sorry, to to podcast and, and to please get it up and running because it would be awesome. But but until then, you've got an Instagram page? Yes, it's, it's Feet of Clay. Part of that was just to organize the story because this has been, it's been a little minute, right, since all this has happened and just to kind of go through my pictures and go through my journals and unearth the things that I think would be pertinent. And then it is getting the time to actually, you know, I got a microphone, but, you know, being able to just get that time and, and putting that down. So I appreciate that. I that is my purpose, you know, even for us in ICT, right, we were always reading the greats, like Finney and Reese Howe's Intercessor, and like, who wrote those fucking stories, right? There's, there, they make these people out to be, you know, these giants, it's like, I'm sure there's another side to those stories that we're all trying to be like these. Oh, yeah, just like Keith Green. Just like Keith Green, and so my dad, throughout my whole life, would always say, 
all idols have feet of clay. He just said he was a student of history. You know, we lived in Italy through a time and I'm like, all idols. So it's like that statue, that statue literally in my head, do they have feet of clay underneath there? And so obviously going through this, I'm like, oh my God, I get it. All idols have feet of clay. All these people that we've built up this, this story and this mythos are human beings and chances are people are trying to live up to something that's absolutely not true and absolutely not the full story. And that is the thing with Keith. Now, to this day, I love his music. I mean, you guys have that going on with Hillsong, right? Some beautiful, powerful music does not mean that the people who created that are worthy to start a commune <laughs> and tell you how to live your life. I've only just drawn the parallel that is that there's the music as well, that it's the music that is the vehicle for the message in the same way that it was with Keith. Oh, I've, I've got to write this down. That's That's a really good parallel there. Yeah, amazing. You know, I, I just want to throw something your way that, you know, Melody's book was No Compromise. Your podcast is called Feet of Clay. I think your subtitle should be Some Compromise. Some Compromise. That's that, the first time, you know, my friend Sharon and I were like, I guess you guys can swear on your podcast. It's like, motherfucker, you're supposed to compromise in life. <laughs> it's like you, you have to compromise, you know, with people. So, yeah. When you try to really live a life of no compromise, you're not a very pleasant person to be around. I'll just say that. Uh, look, I, I think you are going to have so many people interested in the story. We follow you on Instagram and uh, are awaiting you to drop your first episode, but also people in our, um, we've got a private Facebook group. Somebody posted there about you and about following you on Instagram. And we had all of these people searching for your podcast and coming back on our feed on Facebook going, I can't find the podcast. Where's the it? podcast? Yeah. So we said to people, just stand by. It, it's coming, but we're also meeting with you and you're going to tell a bit of your story with us on this podcast. So people are itching to hear. So I think today is going to give them a teaser of what is to come. And that's really, really exciting for yeah, us. Yeah, because we can't we can't do your story justice, you know, in in just over an hour. But I think you know that that long form process of you getting that out and telling your story and and you know inviting others in to to tell their stories as it intersects with yours. This is going to be a wonderful podcast, and I, I'm so I'm so ready. You know what I mean? Like I, I want this podcast. Please bring it. Oh, well, that's awesome! Thank you. This is very good motivation. And like I said, my best friend, who was the wife of the elder, who goes back with Keith way before I do, has some fantastic stories. So I, I do think you need to change the photo on your podcast just to have a lamb over your shoulders, just something like that. I mean, I, I heard that's really good and it it really attracts audience and gets people in. <laughs> but no, I know it's just a little bit of feedback from me. Just, just a suggestion. If you can't publish every day, then don't bother publishing at all. <laughs> well, the, the, great. I feel very... <laughs> <laughs> Got some marching orders. Wonderful. Yeah. No, no compromise. Mm -hmm. No compromise. So it's so good to have you on our show, Tracy. It's been wonderful. I, I'm drawing so many parallels in your story with ours. I'm drawing so many parallels in the stories that I'm listening to people in, in Hillsong and, and Bethel and these kinds of places as well. This is nothing new. And I think some of our millennial listeners might be listening to this going, who, what? I really encourage you to look into the history of all this because nothing is new. You know, nothing is new under the sun to quote the Bible. Sorry to trigger anyone. But <laughs> this is this is not a new story. And the story that you're a part of in whatever group you're a, you're a part of now listening to this is not new as well. And, you know, if we don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. You know, we're bound to repeat those mistakes. So I want to encourage you to look into the, to the history of Keith Green and look into the history of, of Last Days Ministries. But when this podcast comes out, I think you're going to really, yeah, you're really going to do some good. So... So go for it, Tracy, please. And you have you have our teenage fundamentalist blessing. That's amazing. So I appreciate that very, very much. So No, it's awesome. All the best with everything. And and to Sharon, we're here we're gonna hear some of Sharon's stories by the sound of it on your podcast. So that'll yes. be exciting. We we do love it. So look, thank you again for coming on and and having a chat with us and opening up your life through story. It's and my incredible. closet. And your closet, yeah, for those, obviously, this won't be video, but Sharon is in her closet and she's still she's in the closet. She's deep in the closet. She's deep yeah. in the closet. She yeah, is. That's it. She's still there. Um, we, we haven't, maybe we'll do a part two and it's the coming out. 
of the closet. <laughs> Maybe that's when you launch your podcast. But no, it'll be amazing. So thank you again and um, best of luck to you with everything going forward and maybe we will talk again but if not I'm sure so many are going to resonate with your story and you'll reach them particularly around the high controlling group high control group that that is definitely a theme so thank you again Tracy well thank you you guys have been wonderful if you'd like to connect with the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast, then please see the links in our link tree in the show notes. We invite you to pop across to our very vibrant listener community on Facebook, which is a private group, and we're also on Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. Also, a huge thank you to Lucy, who manages our social strategy, and to Kerry and Bree, who manage our Facebook listener group. All of our episodes are transcribed to increase accessibility and the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. It's produced and hosted by Brian McDowell and Troy Waller, with all sound production and editing done by Troy Waller. You can find all these links in our link tree in the show notes. <laughs>